has set a precedent for us with his uh, opening jokes. I'm not a comedian, but I'm going to give it a shot. So there's a little boy named Billy. Billy had been misbehaving and was sent to his room. After a while, he emerged and he informed his mother that he had thought things over and that he had said a prayer. He had talked to God. And his mother was very pleased with that and said, good. She said, you know, if you talk to God and ask him to help you quit misbehaving, he will do it. And Billy said, oh, I didn't ask him to help me misbehave. I just asked him to help you put up with me. <laughs> Isn't that the way we too often act with God, though? Is it not? We want him to change to suit us and not us to change to suit him. And it doesn't work out very well, huh? If you would turn with your Bibles, uh, in your Bibles with me to the book of Luke. We're going to start in chapter 5. And in verse 33. That's Luke 5, 33. Scripture says, And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. And they will fast in those days. And he also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, it will tear the new, and the new piece from the will not the new piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says, the old is good. So we know that during Jesus' ministry on the earth, these Jewish leaders thought that Jesus didn't do things quite the way they wanted him to. Amen? Here we see the Pharisees and the scribes are starting to question him. And they said to him, in verse 33, the disciples of John fast and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. So more or less he's saying, you know, the disciples of the Pharisees, disciples of John, are following all the prescribed uh, religious traditions and everything that, that we think that they ought to. Why aren't you? Why do your disciples not do the same thing? Verse 34, Jesus said to them, Can you make the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. So who is the bridegroom? Jesus. Jesus, right? And he calls us his bride, the church. Jesus is saying, there will come a time when I will be taken away from my disciples, and that time they will mourn and they will fast. In fact, Jesus says in the latter half of Luke chapter 7 that John came in performing all of these strict religious rites and acts. But I came eating and drinking, drinking wine, having parties with tax collectors. And you guys wouldn't hear the message from either one of us.
But back to chapter 5. Even though he said to his disciples would eventually fast and pray after his passing, he wanted to make sure one thing was clear. In verse 36 it says, he also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. So put this in the context of today. Do you pay 50, 60, 70 bucks, whatever, for a pair of jeans? Are you going to cut a hole in it and use that for a patch on your old jeans? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? You would ruin the new jeans, and the denim patch that you cut out of it's not even going to match the old jeans. Same thing in verse 37, he says, And no one puts new wine skins, or new wine, into old wine skins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine desires the new, for he says the old is good. Now we know that wine skins are made out of just that, animal skins, right? And animal skin, just, just like our skin, is flexible. And as new wine ferments, what happens? It creates gas, it expands. And that flexible new wine skin will expand with it. But what happens when you put that new wine into an old wine skin? Old wine skins have dried out. They've become rigid, not flexible anymore. When that wine expands, poof. They're going to break the old wine skins, and what happens to the wine? It's destroyed. So what was Jesus trying to say here? And certainly he's not just giving us lessons on how to be a tailor or how to be a wine dresser, amen? You cannot transplant a new covenant life in Christ onto the old covenant man-made traditions of the life these Pharisees are living, amen? <coughs> And they do not judge Jesus' disciples by any other standard than the one Jesus set himself. Jesus did not come to give an upgrade to the rabbinical schools of the dead. We didn't want to see Halil and Shammai 2.0. He came to lay the foundation of a new way of thought. One based on spirit and truth. Amen. Now, did he come to nullify the law of God? As Paul says, certainly not. He himself, in Matthew chapter 5, said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches that to others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now there are those these days that would say that Jesus coming to fulfill the law means that the Old Testament has no bearing on Christian's life. How many churches do we see now that don't even have the Old Testament? The Bible is just the New Testament. And certainly that may be true in some sense. I know if we've all read the book of Hebrews and other things. If we're talking about some of the, uh, what we would call, some people would call the ceremonial things. You notice we didn't sacrifice any lambs on the altar this morning. We don't have any bulls waiting out back. That's because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. Amen? Yes. 
He gave the sacrifice once and for all. So there is no longer any sacrifice for sin other than him. But to those who would say that the Old Testament has no bearing on us, that Jesus fulfilled the law and it's gone, I would ask, did Jesus fulfill murder? Can we just go about killing anyone we want now? Did he fulfill lying, cheating, stealing? No. Those very much apply to us, amen? So in the parables, Jesus is not just telling us to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But what he is saying is that these Jews cannot graft a new life in Christ onto the worldly ways of our old life. Amen? You cannot graft my new mindset onto your old mindset. To do so would damage or destroy both. And God didn't record these parables and scriptures just so we could look back at the Pharisees and make judgments about them, did he? Amen. He gave it to us as an example for our life as well. A life in Christ is not an upgrade or an add-on to the life that we already had. It's a replacement. We can't do life the way we used to. We are now a new creation. Amen? Amen. In the book of John, if you want to turn again with your Bibles with me, chapter 3, starting in verse 3, that's John 3.3. 3. I'll give you a couple seconds to get there. You better be fast because I'm only giving you a couple seconds. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Amen. Turn once with me again to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17. God says through the Apostle Paul, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Amen. And this new creation needs to be treated as such. Again, Christ did not, um, Christ is not to be treated as an add-on in our lives. Amen. We are not to try to fit him in wherever we have time or wherever it's convenient. Christ should be the center of our life. Everything else that you put in your life should be added on, put in where it belongs. But Jesus comes first, amen? And whatever is not compatible with him, what should we do with that? that part of your life should be removed. Just as in the parables, if we just try to graft a life in Christ into our own lives, both will be damaged or destroyed. The old life must be wiped away and a new life put in its place. And similarly, when, when a disciple tries to dredge up parts of his old life and graft it back onto the new life, it's only going to cause pain and misery, amen? As I like to tell folks, when you give your heart to Christ, there is no take-backs. 
If you give your heart to Christ and later start stuffing or grafting in parts of your own life, there will be damage and misery. Amen? It may not be today, but you can be sure it's coming. Christ chastises those he loves. Amen? If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ and you're trying to graft in parts of your old life, do yourself a favor. Stop. Amen. And similarly, when a disciple tries to, uh, uh, if you gave your Christ and you're still trying to graft Jesus into your old life, stop. Save yourself and save Jesus some pain and misery. What happens when we sit around and watch our child making a bad decision? I think a lot of times it hurts us more than it does them. Now think about your Heavenly Father when He looks at you and you're making those bad decisions. You're trying to graft that old life back onto your life in Him. You're not only causing yourself misery, but you're causing Him misery. And before we go to an invitation, I, I want to leave you with a piece of scripture. Turn with me in your Bibles again. This one's Philippians chapter 3, starting about halfway through verse 4. Philippians 3, 4. This is Paul again. He says, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh. I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever I gained, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Can I get an amen? amen. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies ahead, lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us be hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory is their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Paul had much to brag about in his old life in front of all the Jews. Amen. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He had it all. He said he was blameless. But he left all of it. And not only did he leave all of it, he counted all of it as nothing more than trash. All the lofty goals that they had set for themselves, he now considered rubbish. And the same for us. All the things that our society wants us to attain. How great an athlete can you be? How much money can you make? Are you climbing up the ladder at work fast enough? All of these things that are earthly, that are set before us by Satan as temptations, we should also consider nothing more than rubbish when compared to Christ. Amen? If you would, bow your heads with me. If you do not know Christ today as your Lord and Savior, if you have not completely given your heart to Jesus Christ, then there is no better day than right now, today, for you to do that. We are not guaranteed to be here tomorrow. So I'm begging you, if you feel God tugging in your heart and you know that you should be giving your life to Him, do it today. I felt that tug when I was 16 years old and I was too arrogant and prideful to let it happen. And I spent the next 20 years creating scars on my soul, living a worldly life until I finally gave my life to Christ. Don't be me. Give your life to Jesus today. If that's you, I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment. You know I'm to say it out loud, but you do have to mean it with every bit of your heart. If you would, pray with me now. Heavenly Father, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I know that I need you in my life, and I repent of my sins, and I place my faith in you. I ask that you replace my will with your will, and I will follow you for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, we pray. Every head still bowed, every eye still closed. If there's one in the church today that said that prayer, I ask you to just look up at me and raise your hand. And I have three questions for you. Will there be one? Maybe you're a believer in Christ. Maybe you are the disciple. And you have found yourself trying to graft in part of your old life. There's always the opportunity every day to turn back to God, to repent of our mistakes and move on. Because He is a forgiving God. Amen. You may raise your head. Brother Barry, would you leave us in the uh, invitation? This yeah. altar is open for you. You have the ability to stand. Would you stand with us at this time?